pray for them. And I will uh, I want to remind you tonight about something Paul was obsessed with. And if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians 9. Uh, one of the thing, one thing about Paul, he was obsessed with winning. And actually, in the old King James would have would have been a little better here in that in these uh, about four verses or five, he talks about that he might win some. And I'll read those in a minute. But actually, the, King, the old King James translates that word gain. And over the years, I've realized that may be a better word. It's not a word that we think of in, in our vocabulary as much, but it's a word that might be better in the, in the idea of gaining what Paul was called to gain, what Paul wanted to gain. He wanted to gain folks who heard the gospel and then shared the gospel. And Paul was obsessed with sharing the gospel. I wonder what we're obsessed with. And, and then yesterday, I got uh, uh, an email. I think it was from, uh, I think from Baptist Press. I want to ask you some questions. Now, this thing talks about modern-day idols. Anybody want to hazard a guess what the number one modern-day idol is in the church? Church people church people what's the one number one thing those are good guesses not number one number one and I think we're all guilty of it now we got padded pews comfort and the truth is in most churches if we had to sit like most churches in the world we wouldn't show up Oh, my back won't my back won't take it. Uh, I remember in 1994 we went to a little church in Romania, and we took a couple guys that did woodwork, and they wanted them to build some benches, and they brought these 12-inch uh, boards in, rough boards, that none of you ladies would sit on because it would mess up your clothes. And the the guy came up to him and said, "Now, pointing to pointing to." to speak to him in sign language and he went whoosh, whoosh, across the board which meant cut that thing in half and have a little six inch board to sit on and one of them said to the other did he want us to split that I said I didn't understand that and you didn't either say so just nod your head so he they made them 12 inches and we went out and bought more boards to, to be used no backs just bench they would sit there for hours. He said, in America, we're spoiled. The second most, uh, that was, by the way, that was 67%. Anybody want to guess what the second one is? Control or security. I had a guy come the other day, and I, I forget what he asked me about, but he, he looked at a, that was one of my neighbors. He said, we just redid our security. He said, now I see your sign. He said, I think that looks like the sign. Like my, our sign is probably 25 years old and it's faded. But it just looks like it's, there's some kind. I shouldn't tell you all that. We don't have security. As a matter of fact, if somebody broke into our house, they'd say, oh, they don't have as good stuff as I got. And they'd leave us some money to buy some upgrades on our stuff. But we're, we're obsessed with that. It's an idol. We've got to be careful. And, and there are places down there, people who say, I, I can't go to that church. There was a robbery down there. It's 14 years ago, but I still remember it. And so wherever you are, we're concerned about that. And, and that was 56% of the people. That was one of their, the third one is, y'all already got that one's money. Everybody's obsessed with money. I hope you're not obsessed with the stock market right now, but the money is, a, is an issue. 55% of the people, that's an idol that we say we don't, we don't care about money. But really, do we? Don't raise your hand, but I wonder how many of you have been looking at your statements lately, your retirement statements, your stock statements. <laughs> if you've been looking at them, you've been depressed. And then third one, approval. Can I tell you, pastors have a problem with 
that. That's one of the idols of pastors. We like for people to approve us. We like it when they say, good sermon, or thank you, pastor, and you're a wonderful pastor, and approval. People want that approval, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But that doesn't need to be an idol. The, the one we need to be approved by is God himself. And then success, whatever you call success, uh, if you're a uh, football coach or a basketball coach, you get all that money, but you better win ball games or you won't keep all that money. You won't keep getting all that money. Influence. People are obsessed with being influential. There's even a category now on our phones of influencers. I tell you what, they don't influence me. And there, there's something called TikTok that I keep getting this thing that says, you need to join TikTok. I have a digital watch. I don't need it. Uh, and then, then there's uh, political power. You think anybody's got an idol of political power? Even in the church. And, and politics is not just state houses and Congress and all that. In the church, there are those who are obsessed with power in the church. People are obsessed with power. And finally, and this is only 32%, sex or romantic love. It's amazing. Comfort is ahead of romantic love and, and sex. Uh, our world is, is so messed up, and it's because we have the wrong priorities and we have the wrong things that we care about. But Paul, in, in, in starting in verse 19, he is obsessed with sharing the gospel. He is obsessed with telling others how they can know Christ and be submitted to him and have an eternal life and a great life here. As I've already said, verses 19, 20, 21, 22, and 24 is, is uh, when. But that's in the New King James. If you've got an old King James Bible, it probably says gain. He wants to gain. Now, in chapter 8, which is a chapter just before this one, Paul speaks of what he does not do to hinder the gospel. Tonight, I want us to look at what he speaks of, what he wants to do to further the gospel. And he's obsessed with it. I mean, there's no other word to say that. Paul, and, and the reason I believe Paul is so obsessed with sharing the gospel is he remembers what he was. You know, we have a tendency to forget some of us have been saved so long, we forget. And some of us were saved at a young age. So we don't really have that life that's, that, that was degrading. And, and we've been in church all our life. But folks, no matter what we are, Paul had been in church in the same vein of things all his life. He was a scholar in the Old Testament. He was a scholar that studied with the greatest theological minds of his day and and God chose to use him now Paul was the, uh, when he was Saul he was the opposite of what he is today he was obsessed with getting rid of Christians getting rid of the, the gospel now in verse 9 we see or chapter 9 we see he's obsessed with sharing the gospel so look with me uh, Chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 27. Let me just read those, and then we'll go through them kind of verse by verse. <clears throat> For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. I might gain the more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might win or gain Jews. To those who are under the law, so as under uh, under the are under the law as under the law that i might win those who are under the law paul says i'll stick with the law even though i have freedom i'm going to do what's what the law says verse 21 to those who are without law as without law not having been not having not being without law toward god but under law toward christ that i might win those who are without law 
to the weak. I became as a weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it with you. Do you not know that those that run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Now Paul reminds us, right at the very beginning, he preaches to any socioeconomic level. That should not even factor in to who a church reaches out to. Back in the 90s, there's a lot of this church growth. It's called the church growth movement. And the idea was that if you want a upper-class church, you went out and started a church in an upper-class neighborhood, and you reached out to those folks. And I actually heard a fellow say, well, listen, uh, we go there because if we reach those people, then they'll expect us to live like they do, and they'll pay us so we can live like them. You see, that was a part of that comfort thing we talked about a little bit ago. But Paul didn't have a clue, and he didn't care. Remember, Jesus didn't care. All he knew was, all he saw was somebody who needed salvation. And that's what Paul saw. Paul saw people who needed the Lord. And so he wanted to reach those people with the gospel. And he constantly preached to anybody who would listen. Didn't matter if you're rich, poor, you're in the penthouse or the outhouse he wanted to share the gospel with you that was his obsession he was obsessed with it he preached to any spiritual level now we understand socioeconomic level and and there are times where you can go into a poor area and they're more willing to listen to the gospel one of the problems right now in our neighbors and our friends is that many of them think they don't have a need for anything. What, what do we need Jesus for? And we got, look, I got a nice house. I drive a, a, a nice SUV and a, and a Lexus over here, and, and, and I, we go on these great vacations, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when we start saying, we got everything, and remember, Jesus talked about that in Revelation. You got everything you need. You don't realize how much you really need. And we forget what, what we have comes from him. It doesn't really belong to us. Paul would preach to those at any level economically, but also he preached to those at any spiritual level. From those who couldn't even read Scripture, who had no clue what Scripture, didn't even know that it was a Scripture, he preached to them just like he preached to those who were scholars in the Hebrew tradition. He preached to anybody who would listen. One of the most heart-wrenching things I, I, I went through in seminary, I was transitioning through seminary and got to, to meet some great friends. And one of them was a fellow named Gary Galliotti. He uh, was an Old Testament professor who never got through a lesson without preaching for at least 15, 20 minutes. And he had a booming voice. He would not need a microphone. Trust me, in this room, if you sit here, if you sit in the back, if you sit down at the exit, at the end of the ramp, you could hear Dr. Galliotti. Matter of fact, several of us never got to have a class with him because he came in our last year. We would come early for our class that met in the same classroom he had and sit out in the hall on the floor and just listen to him. He used to talk about... God is a coming down kind of God. He doesn't just sit up there. He's a coming down kind of God. And you didn't understand that. But we loved him. We got to be good friends with him. He taught a class up in Shelby. And it was a class I'd already had, so I went up early and, uh, and uh, had lunch with him sometimes. 
And one day he came to me with tears in his eyes, and there had been an Old Testament professor who was brilliant in the, in the Old Testament. He could pick up a, a, an Old Testament or written in Hebrew and begin reading it and speaking it in English. And you could take your English Bible, and he never missed a word. He was brilliant. He had studied in Europe. He had studied in Israel. He could give you facts and numbers, but he never really talked about having a relationship to God. And Dr. Galileo saw me one day at lunch. He said, Larry, I need to talk to you a minute. And he said, will you pray with me? He knew I knew that professor. And it, that professor was brilliant, but he had a very liberal mindset theologically and when they would write at classes you'd have say 250 people to take Old Testament and you had three professors they limited Dr. Galeota's class to 75 people that's all he could handle that left 75 more the other second professor would get 70 and the old professor who had been around for years was brilliant he'd get three or four students and that's because they couldn't get into other classes Gary Galileo said Larry I was down visiting with him he's sick and he said I cannot get a clear testimony of him ever surrendering his life to Christ he said will you pray with me Dr. Galeotti had tears trickling down his face he said Larry I've grown to love him we don't agree on almost anything but he's a lost man brilliant but he doesn't know the gospel he thinks his brilliance and his knowledge is what he needs he said what he needs is to come like a child he said I can't get through to him he said he will talk to me he will listen he said I'm asking friends of mine to pray for him and that's a painful thing when you think about it somebody who understands scripture and they're out there everywhere folks they're out there everywhere they understand what the word says and are brilliant in it and Paul is saying I need to talk to them as well now Paul was unique in that Paul was also a brilliant man Paul also knew the scripture and he understood it but more importantly, he had the one who wrote Scripture inside of him. And so when he was talking about it, he was not speaking from Paul's mind. He was speaking from the heart of God. And that was a major difference. So no matter if they were wealthy or poor or brilliant or active in church. And Kyle talked about his pens. I remember, I remember seeing a guy that his knee would bump his Sunday school pins because you got that little pin and that's a little pin you had to be getting on up there because it was it had a little hook on it and it and you just go right down your chest and boy he'd come in with that thing and he only reason it didn't drag the floor his, his shoulders back so far but it, it kept off the floor and, and, and that was a that was like a spiritual high for him when in fact he had no real spiritual sense he just showed up every Sunday because every year at the end of the year they'd call all the people down who had perfect attendance and they all came down there and stood up in a couple years I was with them always brought the bulletin back and Kyle talked about that Sunday that's so true the spiritual level of some people they reached that such spiritual level that they're too smart and too spiritual to trust God they trust themselves so Paul preached to them look Look at the first part of verse 20. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. That's who he's talking about there. The pharisaical attitude. I see that a lot in our culture today. You, you've got the folks over here that are saying, well, I just want that little loving Jesus that loves everybody. There's nothing wrong with anybody. Why, you can just have your best life now because you're okay. Just get up every morning and say, I'm okay, and you're okay. And then you got the other side saying, 
you're not okay. You're degenerate. And thus saith the Lord, and I'm going to chop your head off because you are acting like you some some kind of humble person. Well, there's both ends of that spectrum are dangerous. No matter where you are on that spectrum, you've got to be careful. But Paul said, I speak to those at any spiritual level. But also he says in, in the second part of, of verse 20 and the, through verse 22, notice he says, that I might win some who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, those that I might win those who are without law. And he's saying any status level. Have you, anybody ever told you, when I, I'm a Christian and you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Anybody ever heard that? That's true. But you know what? If you are a Christian, you will go to church. And it's not because you have to. It's because you want to. You want to get together with fellow believers. And there's a desire to exalt God. There's an a desire to want to know Him more. There's a desire to put Him not first in your life, but everything in your life. And, and we forget that. And, and we get this idea that there are some folks that, man, they just don't need it. They're, they're, they've, they've reached it. And it scares me sometimes when I talk to fellow pastors and, and church leaders who you talk to them with you think well, they think they've arrived they don't have they don't have to learn anything else they, they can do what they want to do and they're okay well that's not true because if our heart's desire is to know God we're going to love him and if we love Jesus we're going to love his church because Jesus loved the church he loved us as a church so much that he died for us. He gave his life for the church. So if you love Jesus, you're going to love what Jesus loved if you really know him. That's the defined mission that Paul had. Paul said, I, that's my mission, is to share the gospel with no matter what socioeconomic level, no matter what spiritual level, and no matter what status they are. But then... Paul gives you a, the mandate that's delineated. Now, my wife already asked me what that word means. I don't know. I just put it in there. It's good. Uh, it, the word saved is significant because the lost are perishing. And de, he's dele, delineating the fact that that's the issue. The lost are perishing. They're not going to perish. They are perishing. They're not going to die. They are dead. They just haven't got to that point where physically they're dead. If we're not right relationship with God, we're dead. And Paul is saying, we've got to understand, we've got to do whatever it takes to reach them. And remember that saying, the gates of hell shall not prevail. What that really means is people are already in hell. They just physically are not there yet. They're already there in God's economy, so we've got to break down the gates of hell and pull them out. We've got to rescue them. Remember this, the great old hymn, Rescue the Perishing, Care for the Dying. And that's what it means. Those who are perishing are those who are outside of, of, of being with Jesus. That's what death is. And we talk about that at funerals all the time. Because I'm so sorry that you're mother died and your father died well if they're in Christ when they die they've never been more alive and by the way don't ever once if, if I'm up here in, in a casket sometime this body and you come by Paulette don't tell her I'm so sorry Larry died because he ain't dead I might look dead and my body will be dead but once I leave this life I will never be more alive because life is a relationship with God. Death is being separated from God. Remember, whatever it takes, we've got to share with people that truth and that gospel. You think about this. If you had the cure for every cancer, if you had figured it out, would you tell anybody? 
What if you had the cure for diabetes? Would you tell everybody or would you say, well, I got it down here if they come by. I'm going to have it down in the front pew Sunday and people that come by and show up, they come down there and see me, I'll give them the cure. No, we'd get on, we'd get on the Internet with a smartphone and, and say, look what I found. I'll give it to you free, shipping, handling for $95.95. We'd be telling everybody. We'd be excited, but yet we've got the cure for people going to hell, and we don't tell anybody. We, we should tell everybody. Look at verse 23, just to remind us. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it with you. Paul is saying, I want you to have this relationship that I had. I want everybody to have it. And I want to be one that tells people just like you tell people. Paul is assuming that the church at Corinth is going to be willing to tell people. Folks, it's not what we desire or want that's important. It's not. What's important is what we're called to do. We're called to share the gospel. We're called to say things in a proper manner. Uh, someone said a couple weeks ago to me, well, are you going to come to the club championship when the double, oh, no, you got to go to church, don't you, on Wednesday night? I said, no, I don't have to go to church. Oh, are you coming? No. I thought you said you didn't have to go. I don't. But I like it. I go because I get to go. And that's a difference. How many of you have said, and don't raise your hand, well, we got to get, get ready, get, get going, we got to go to church, or I can't do that next Sunday, I got to go to church. That's not what we should be saying. We should be saying, I get to go to church. I can't wait. I get to go and be with my friends. The, the athlete, notice he says, he starts talking about athletics, and Paul was a runner, and he says the athletes train just don't train just to finish even though they may finish second that's not what they train for have you ever have you ever heard somebody say well I'm gonna get in this race hey man I'm gonna do my very best to finish in the top three no they want to win that reminds me of, of a, and he told on himself the president of Southeastern Seminary used to be a runner ran some marathons and he had a little four-year-old son. One of his sons was four-year-old at the time. I'm going to tell you. Don't worry. Paul just said, don't tell that story. But he came in from running, and he was changing clothes, and he had on runner shorts. Now, if you don't know what runner shorts are, they're kind of like uh, a swimsuit. That's all you wear. But it has, and the little boy said, Daddy, why don't you have underwear on? He said, well, some the, the, the underwear is in the, the shorts. He said, I don't see any. He said, yes, they're in there. Just trust me. <laughs> oh, well, this was on a Thursday or Friday. So his little four-year-old is being taken to his Sunday school class. And he tells his teacher, he said, teacher, guess what? I don't have any underwear on because I don't wear them anymore, and my dad don't wear them either. <laughs> now, this is before he was president, but he was a professor at the time. And uh, so be you've got to be careful with that. But truth is, you can't win if you don't train hard. And that's why you've got to know what you need to know. But the, the simple truth is, uh, we're concerned about not knowing enough, and we might get embarrassed. But I guarantee you, 99% of the people you talk to know less about the Bible than you do. They may think they know more. But the one thing they can't dispute is, listen, God has come into my life. He has changed me from inside out. I'm not like I was. I'm not where I need to be. But I'm a whole lot better as I go along the road because God lives inside of me. And I have total and complete faith in that. And finally, verses 26 and 27, notice there's the motivation is described. There is a goal to Paul's discipline we see in verse 26. Let me just read that. Therefore, 
I run, thus not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. He said, I'm not doing this just to be doing it. I'm not doing it because somebody's paying me to do it. I'm doing it because of what God's already done in my life. You see, it's not so that we get a reward. Because we've already been rewarded far beyond anything we could ever imagine. We're going to heaven. And listen, if you think that that's just no ho-hum, ho I'm going to heaven. Yeah, we're all going to heaven. Everybody here tonight is probably going to heaven. So that's a big deal. I always chuckle when I hear people, and you've heard me say this, somebody say, well, I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God about this, and I'm going to ask him about that. I'm going to ask him why he did this. No, you're not. You won't be able to speak. Listen, I'm not a fan of our current president, but I guarantee if I walked in the Oval Office, I probably couldn't say a word. It would be awe-inspiring because of the office, because of where you are. <laughs> and that's nothing compared to what heaven's going to be like. It's going to be incredible. So Paul says, I'm not doing it for something. I'm doing it from something because God has already done more for me than I could ever, ever want or expect. Now, look at verse 27. And there's been some people who have mishandled this verse. He said, but I discipline my body and bring it in subjection, lest when I have preached as others, I myself should become disqualified. Paul is not saying, let me just say that first, he is not saying I could lose my salvation. That's not possible. I've often wondered when, I, when somebody says, well, I know I can lose my salvation. I had a guy tell me, he said, I lost, I walked away from my salvation four times, I find it, but I think I'm back now. I said, well, let me ask you a question. What did you get when you got saved? He said, what do you mean? I, I got eternal life. And I said, so you've been through eternal life and you lost it? Now you're going to go through eternal life again? Well, well no, and it, it, but, but I can walk away. No, you can't. You tell me that God comes in to live inside of you? You say, okay, God, out of here. When you say to him, I surrender my life to you, it's a done deal. It's not going to change. And so Paul is not saying that. Paul is saying, I do not want to get to the point where nobody asks me. Now, I, I retired, and I, I'm, I'm enjoying it. But you know what I enjoy? is preaching every chance I get. The one thing I hope I never lose, I would, I would love to preach my last sermon walk down from the start walking out of a church building somewhere and die of a massive heart attack and be in heaven right then to me that would be the greatest way to go and i i'm not i'm not giving you hyperbole i would love it if you're teaching a sunday school class you'd probably love to be able to share the the gospel in a sunday school class and gone me or sharing the gospel with somebody and going right to heaven to me, that would be the greatest thing could ever come. Now, Paul saw himself as both the kiros, which is the one who is submitted to God, as well as a participant in the race. Paul did not want to be seen as one who said, do as I say, not as I do. That's what he said about being disqualified. Now, I say that a lot on a tennis court to my partner. They'll hit one in the net, and I'll say, hey, do as I say, not as I do. Hit it across the net. And, you know, sometimes we say that. Do as I say, not as I do. The worst thing a parent could ever do. You know that. Because teenagers particularly are smart. They may act like they're not. And they may do dumb things, but they are smart. And they see what you do, and they know what you do is more what you are than what you say. So I'm going to say about that. Now, let me just give you three quick applications we are to share the gospel with every person in the world now we can't go and see every person in the world but we can give to the international mission board through our cooperative program and people around the world will hear the gospel we can help people who are physically able 
and willing to go on mission trips as they go. Secondly, men, a man rather, without Jesus is indeed is in need of salvation. Not necessarily church attendance or church membership. That's secondary. Once he got Jesus, they'll show up. And Paul would remind us as a third application, we need to train with a purpose. Not just to be beating the air. Not so we can walk around and do like that. I can't hold my breath anymore like that. But stand around and I've seen these guys, they work out to work out. And that's wonderful if they want to do that. But that's all they do. They do it to build up muscles. I, I remember a guy in a health club. He was uh, the director of the health club we belonged to many years ago. He got to go into these shows where you, you, you put all these different poses and all these muscles sticking out everywhere. And I thought, man, he is bulking up. What's going on? I went back to see him about four years later about something else. And he was skinnier than I've ever been. What happened? He said, had a stroke. Steroids. See, he was bulking up to bulk up. He was building muscles for the sake of building muscles. Paul's saying, that's not what I'm doing. Paul's saying, I'm training to be effective in ministry. Any comments or questions? And I got one announcement I failed to make that I need to make. <laughs> 